Hi, this is Mark Arnold and Fun Ideas Podcast. And today we have a special guest, uh, Mr. Ken Quattro. Is it pronounced correctly? You got it. All right, very good. <laughs> I've actually never spoken with you before, but I know of your work. Uh, you do a lot of uh, golden age coverage and of history and everything. Um, actually, the first question I wanted to ask you, because I usually ask you, you know, tell me a little bit about your background, but, you know, we're going to talk about this book called Invisible Men, but I could have sworn you've done like dozens of books and I'm not finding any other books. I mean, have you written other books or you just contributed? No, to other I've, books? I've contributed to a lot of books. Oh, I've done okay. uh, like written chapters and stuff that appeared in uh, a lot of books. And I've done a lot of magazine work for like Alder Ego. I've done uh, Comics Journal, uh, a few other magazines and stuff like that. Most of my stuff has appeared online. Okay. And, um, you know, I've done a lot of background work for, uh, heck, I've even done for TV shows and movies. A lot of times I'm, uh, people call me up for uh, historical uh, background information. I'm more of a background kind of guy. <laughs> okay, because, you know, I'm, I did a little background research and I was trying to find out information and I went to Amazon and said, and it's like one book. I yeah. guess sworn he's done his 20. <laughs> no, 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 not yet. All right, very good. Okay, so what I usually start out with is uh, tell me a little bit about yourself and how you got to be a comic book historian. Okay, well, I've been a, a, a comics fan and everything since the early 60s. Mm -hmm. And um, luckily I grew up, I'm from the Detroit area, and I grew up around a lot of, uh, uh, of the early comic cons and stuff like that. And one of the people I got to know was uh, Jerry Bales, mm -hmm. who uh, is considered by a lot of people as one of the founders of uh, comic book fandom. Well, some of the first comic book conventions that were put on here uh, in the United States were uh, in Detroit. It was called the Detroit Triple Fanfare. And anyways, um, I was impressed uh, by Bales, who was a professor at Wayne State University here. And uh, he wrote a lot of historical, some of the for, first historical information about comic books uh, during the 60s. Well, that impressed me. And as I grew older, you know, as I grew out of my, you know, little kid stage of comics and that and started becoming a teenager, I became more and more interested in the actual people who created the comics. And so I started doing my own research. And so basically since the early 1970s, I've been doing uh, extensive research and writing and everything on uh, basically, you know, anything involving comics other than the comic books themselves, even though I read the comics and enjoy them, I'm more interested uh, almost like from an art historian's uh, perspective. That's what my background is. I uh, studied fine art and uh, journalism in college. I went to the University of Michigan and Eastern Michigan University. And uh, that's what my background is and that's what my interest is. And so over the years now, I've written literally thousands. I, on my computer right now, I have something like 7,000 articles mm -hmm. uh, and posts that I've written over the years. And um, I'm basically looking at it like a, a unified uh, um, version of comics history like not just a particular company or particular artist. I'm trying to find, you know, what connects everybody and everything uh, in the in actually involving comics history. And I try to place comics history within the spectrum of overall history, particularly American history. And that's where basically where Invisible Men came from, because there's a lot of black history in there, which was never written about before. And uh, and so there's, there's an overlap between just the comic book history that appears in the book and the actual black history, which I really go into. Because the book itself, if you don't mind me just going on, rambling on here That's for a bit. <laughs> uh, it, the book itself was, was basically sourced by uh, my using black media because almost none of these artists I write about, there, was there any information to be found in any white media? Nothing in white newspapers or magazines or anything about uh, these guys for you know the basic for, for uh, you know for the most part. Mm -hmm. But in black media, almost every single one of the artists I've written about was well known and very mm -hmm. respected. And so I ended up reading literally thousands of black newspapers and magazines and books and essays and everything else written about these men and I try to recreate the world around them that they were living in. Mm -hmm. 
um, in each circumstance, because there's 18 artists I profiled in the book, and each one had a unique uh, life experience. And, you know, one of the, the problems we have here in the United States is we've excised a huge part of our, our history. And a lot of that is the black history. Mm -hmm. And I try to recreate that for a general audience. So anybody reading my book, whether you're white, black or whatever, you can read my book and understand the world that these men came from and the world that they were uh, you know, forced to compete in. And I try to you know, give that experience you know, throughout the book because comic books really are just the entry point into the lives of each one of these men because each one of them had a much longer career mm -hmm. than what they did in comic books. And I think that that's an interesting aspect that a lot of people don't realize because we tend to look at comic book artists as, oh, Jack Kirby, you know, worked in comic books 60 years and, you right. know, that was his entire life. But that's not the, the normal experience, mm -hmm. you know, for a lot of these comic artists, particularly the ones who came out of the golden age. Because for a lot of them, they only worked a handful of years, white and black or Asian or anything else. Mm -hmm. They worked for four or five years and then they went on to something else. Right. And I tried to just, you know, recreate that experience for people in the book. Mm -hmm. Now, in doing your research, um, you actually answered one question I already, I already was curious about is where you got your sources if they weren't in like the regular mainstream white media, we'll say. Um, right. Was it difficult finding these newspapers? Extremely difficult. I was going to say, are there archives or? or, or well, see, that's, that's the yeah. problem there, Mark. Yeah. Um, as we're, a lot of libraries will have collected uh, newspapers over the years, like the New York Times or LA Times or Chicago Tribune, they routinely did not collect black newspapers. And so almost all of them were just thrown away. So well, over the past, because this book, I started on this almost 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. I had, uh, luckily, you know, the, the, the internet was in existence at that time. So I was able to contact a lot of different places, but what I basically had to do is build my own database mm -hmm. of black newspapers. You know, I would find the one of maybe a couple months of a newspaper in, in one city or another city may have a few issues of another mm -hmm. uh, black newspaper. And it was just basically piecing together all this stuff. It, it's a huge <laughs> amount of information I, I've gone through. If, if you could see what I went through, you wouldn't believe it <laughs> to try to put this together because it was, basically, like I said, just creating my own archive to work from. Mm -hmm. And um, and speaking to a lot of uh, uh, Black, uh, I've had a chance to speak to a lot of Black researchers and scholars in the past year since my books come out. And they totally uh, uh, understood what I was talking about because they faced the same issues. Mm -hmm. You know, that information is, is not out there, at least not in, in a, uh, an available, you know, one click source that you right. can go to, like you can go on ProQuest and find, you know, the New York Times, you know, real easily. You can't do that with a, a, the Toledo Bronze Raven, for instance, or something <laughs> like that. You know, like basically right now, I'm still working, I'm working on a sequel to the book, Invisible mm -hmm. Men, okay? And the Toledo Bronze Raven, for instance, exists in one library. I have to get, I'm, physically going to drive down to that library and exist on one on some microfilm that's the only one in existence hmm. but it, it's that sort of thing i've had to do over and over again you know over the past 20 years hmm. did anybody or any source actually have real printed issues after all these years just an archive or an old well, uh, uh, like, bookstore again, or something uh, just some not, oddball thing that I, you might have well found? there are there are hmm. some you know, libraries do have physical issues in that, but unfortunately, a lot of our uh, libraries over here have uh, deacquisitioned a lot of uh, print material. Mm -hmm. You know, I've picked up one issue of the Pittsburgh uh, Courier from the 1950s I have myself, but they're rare, extremely rare to, to find physical copies of this stuff. In yeah, doing all this, I mean, is there... Yeah. Um, after 15, 20 years of doing this, is there still like a big unanswered question? I'm sure you put everything you had in the book as it is, but I mean, is there still like big gaps of your knowledge just because oh, it yeah. really I, isn't there? Because yeah. uh, if when you finish, you get down towards the end of the book now, you'll see I even say that. I, I consider this not the last word on the mm -hmm. subject, the beginning. 
and I hope other people latch onto it in, uh, you know, begin looking into it. Like I say, I had my own research, which is continued. I never stopped. Okay. And there was a lot of material I, we couldn't even fit in the first book because there's only so many pages I was allowed, right, right. you know, by my publisher, you know, they, they're not going to let me write a thousand page book, you know, so mm -hmm. uh, there's, I've, I've constantly been writing this whole time. And like I say, I'm working on the sequel right now. I'm well into it. Mm -hmm. uh, the sequel of the book. Is the sequel you know, going to be more golden age people or is it going to go into well, the it's, it's going to be, or? like I say, it's mostly going to be focused upon the black artists who, uh, who came to the floor in the 1950s. You see, there, it's, it's an interesting uh, history that Blacks have in the comic book industry. They appeared in the very beginning and during World War II. And, and as you read the book, you'll see why there's very specific reasons why uh, they were able to enter the industry at that time. Partly mm -hmm. it, was, it was due to World War II itself because a lot of the white artists were drafted into the military. Mm -hmm. Well, Black artists weren't being drafted for the first three years, um, uh, white uh, draft boards would routinely pass over blacks. They didn't want blacks in the military. So until 1943, very few blacks were drafted into the military, mm -hmm. but it provided an opportunity for the black artists who were left behind, you know, to enter the industry to basically fill in for the white artists, right. okay? so. There was that first group, and that's basically the group who appear uh, in this in my first book. Well, the next book is going to pick up from there because they, I wrote about them. Most of them were out of the industry by 1950 because when the white artists returned, they got their jobs back, and almost all the black artists ended up out of the industry except for a handful like uh, Alvin Hollingsworth and uh, Matt Baker mm -hmm. and a couple others. You know, but basically most of the others had already left the industry. They lost their jobs. Mm -hmm. But then there was another generation that started coming around at the very tail end of the 1940s and into the 1950s. Guys like Tom Feelings and uh, Warren Broderick and stuff like that. And these were guys who were younger, you know, 10, 15, 20 years younger than the first generation. But this second generation grew up with comic books because they were much younger and they have a, a different perspective in a different way. And it's, it, you'll, you'll see how they differ this second generation differs from the uh, first generation. And that's what I'm gonna to try to uh, show in the second book. Right. I mean, that even happened to white uh, artists as well, or writers, uh, you know, the first generation, it was a job. Then the second exactly. generation, they were fans. And so, you know, different right. perspective on it, so. Total, totally different. And the one other interesting thing, Mark, is that by 1959, 1960, there was no more black artists in comic books. Hmm. Matt Baker died in 1959 and his last artwork appeared in a comic book in 1960, okay? Mm -hmm. After that, there's no black artists in the early silver age of comics. Mm -hmm. If you look at, you know, DC and Marvel, you know, and Archie and stuff like that, or Harvey, even, you know, you, you all know, yeah. there's really no black artists until the end of the 1960s. It's not right. like 1969. Yeah. So there's like a nine year gap. Mm. In, a, in comics history where there's no black artists working mainstream newsstand comics, which is really strange when you think that it parallels the beginning of the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. You know, you would think that there have been blacks, you know, working, but there wasn't, right. you know, and it, it, during that same time period is when like the Black Panther was created and stuff like that, but there was no blacks working in comic books. Right. It's just weird. It's just a very, very strange uh, circumstance. Now you mentioned it in the book, um, obviously it's outside the scope of the book, but one of them worked for him is um, Bertram Fitzgerald, which I did have the pleasure of interviewing a few years before he passed away. Mm -hmm. um, and he did Golden Legacy and then an Archie knockoff called Past Willie Jackson. Exactly. And uh, he employed a black artist that also worked for Archie called Gus Lemoyne. Um, do you think that uh, Bert Fitzgerald's Golden Legacy had any uh, anything to do with maybe a resurgence of Black people re-entering the field? Or yeah, was it just definitely. the field? And, and oh, see, okay. Yeah, see, that's one of the things I'm going to try to get to in the book, because okay. that falls at the tail end of, of the period I'm going to be covering. Right. But one of the artists, actually two of the artists who worked for uh, Fitzgerald on the Golden Legacy books were Tom Feelings, who started mm -hmm. in mainstream comic books in the early 50s, but mm -hmm. he left. He right. became a fine artist, a very highly respected fine artist. He didn't uh, uh, 
come back into comics until he worked with Fitzgerald, which is much later, about 15 years later. And the other artist was Ezra Jackson. Ezra mm -hmm. Jackson was, was a comic book artist right during you know, the 1940s. He was a partner of, of Maurice Whitman, if you know that name at all. Uh, right. He did a lot of stuff for Fiction House and stuff mm -hmm. like that, pretty well-known uh, white artists. Mm -hmm. They were a team during the 1940s. Well, by the end of the 1940s, so Ezra Jackson was out of comic books, totally out of comic books. And he didn't re-enter until Bertrand Fitzgerald, you know, came back and started Golden Legacy. So uh, Fitzgerald basically sort of like reignited that, uh, you know, the opportunity for Blacks to be in comics, but still, even though, you know, Feelings and Jackson were not in the mainstream comics. It was just, it was, it was a weird circumstance, you know, how it happened like that. Well, from Fitzgerald's own words, it was really difficult for him to get published. I mean, oh, yeah. he finally yeah. Uh, had to go down to Coca-Cola and they took a chance on him as kind of a sponsor right. to help exactly. him out and stuff like that. Yeah. So, and, you know, it, it just seems weird looking back on it because it seems like, ah, oh, you know, I, I have talent you're hired, you know, it's like, uh, it should be as simple as that. But, you know, I guess there's always prejudices and exclusivity and well, everything else. But what's, you know? what's funny about it, Mark, is that um, even though there were the prejudices in that, for instance, you know who hired more Blacks uh, in comics working in comic books than anybody else? Stan Lee. I was going to say that, but I didn't want to guess that. No, but yeah, I mean, in yeah. the early 1950s, he hired, I've got it down to like about six of the black artists who were working. Basically almost every single black artist who was working in comic books was working for him at Timely Atlas. At the same time, they weren't working anywhere else. Basically hardly anywhere else. You didn't see him at EC. You didn't see Matt Baker, Al Hollingsworth at EC. You didn't see him at DC. You know, you didn't see him at Harvey or you didn't see, you know, they were working for Stan Lee. He right. hired Warren Broderick, uh, uh, you know, Matt Baker, all these other guys, you know, and, you know, it's it's one of those sort of things that I know Stan Lee's such a highly controversial figure and so many people dislike him and stuff like that. I like but him. the man provided work for a lot of people, you know, in, yeah. uh, even people who other people wouldn't hire. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's one of those things for, like I say, it's going to come out in my second uh, book here that I, I'm going to touch upon that. Because there's, there's like quiet racism, Mark, and, and you, I, you know what I'm talking about, yes. mm -hmm. you know, and especially back in the past, mm -hmm. you know, I'm old, I'm 68 years old, so I remember the 1950s a little bit, but I remember the 1960s very, very well. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> there was this, um, it's almost like a benign racism, uh, mm -hmm. this, a term used, it's called soft racism, yeah. where people are racist without being racist, you know. Right. And that's what a lot of the book Invisible Men is about, where people would look past Blacks, they wouldn't even see them, you know. But even in later times, not just in the 1930s and 40s, in later, more evolved times, we do the same thing. Right. And we have, up until very recently, you know, yeah. done that. And again, you know, I, I, I don't preach in my books and that. I just give historic examples of things. And I want people to... Uh, you know, make their own conclusions when you read histories and stuff like that. And I say, you know, if you read each one of the profiles I do in there, I give, you know, I go into the, the life and uh, the community that each one of these guys came from, because each one was different. Some mm -hmm. came from the, you know, the deep south, some came from New York City, some came from Pennsylvania or the Midwest. Each mm -hmm. one had a different, you know, Black experience. And again, talking to, to some of these uh, Black uh, historians, that's one thing they appreciated because, again, it, it, we have a tendency here in the United States to look at uh, the Black experience as one monolithic thing. It was right. exactly the same for every Black right. you know, who was in the United States, which isn't true. You know, it, it wasn't true for any other uh, ethnic group. I'm Italian, okay? Mm -hmm. But my family that came to the United States, they ended up moving to West Virginia and becoming coal miners. They went to New York City and you The know. Godfather and all that stuff, <laughs> you know? And then they moved up to Detroit and became uh, factory workers. Totally different experience than what, like, movies would lead you to believe. You know, every Italian in this country, you know, lived in Little Italy in New York. They right. did, you know? <laughs> 
I mean, it seems that way, I guess, because the comics book industry and other industries in the past have been so dominated with the New York influence. And exactly. uh, so, you know, you don't think about, you know, oh, like even as a kid, you know, and, you know, I was connected to Harvey, even though I did read my superhero comics right. and everything else. But even then, uh, Spider-Man, Superman, Batman, uh, Richie Rich, anybody, they're all in the big city, you know, you have skyscrapers right. and I didn't grow up in that. I grew up in California where yeah. it was pretty rural growing up. And then later on is Silicon Valley. And so now there's buildings and stuff like that. But as a kid, I go, right. oh, okay, they do these over there somewhere, <laughs> which is not here because this is basically farmland. So I get it, but you know, they have a very myopic oh, view yeah. of the yeah. world. I mean, it's, in, it's, it's totally different point of view, you know, yeah. Uh, with comic books, especially like when you realize all these comics are basically happening in New York City, all the right. the landscapes and everything are in New York City. You know, yeah. I grew up in the Detroit area, which is, you know, a big city, but I grew up in the suburbs and, you know, we didn't have skyscrapers all over the place, you know, <laughs> the Spider-Man, so if Spider-Man had been born here, he'd been swinging from a tree, you know, it's a it <laughs> silo. You can't lunch you know. my thing. <laughs> yeah, you know, it been totally different, you know, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just funny like that. By the way, I did one of uh, Howard Howie Post, one of the last uh, interviews oh, very that, cool. uh, years ago. Did you have an opportunity to talk to him? I did once, but uh, he was very elderly at the time and a little bit. Right, that's the same thing. I and that was pretty much it. Uh, I had a couple of friends that also interviewed him and I reprinted interviews with my old fanzine Harvey book yeah. one time. So, yeah, I love um, Post's work in that. Yeah. I do have a Harvey question, but I will get to that in a minute. Uh, yeah, okay, I'm sorry. I'll but just... that's okay. Um, what was I going to ask? Uh, we were talking about regional things and, oh, darn. Uh, <laughs> um, oh, I know. Uh, I have, I admit, prior to we get, went on the air. So this is the book, Invisible Men. I have not read the entire book yet because I kind of, okay. this is one of those books I want to savor and go through. So I've only read the first couple chapters, but you profile at least 30 people, it looks like. Um, oh, there's 18. 18. Excellent. Okay. It looks like, yeah, I, I was just looking briefly at the contest page. Okay. So a lot of people. Anyway, <laughs> um, did you actually interview any of them directly? Because you mentioned Matt Baker who passed away in 59. Well, so, you know, were they all gone by the time? Yeah. The only one who was still alive when I, uh, uh, during the time I was writing the book was Calvin Massey. Mm -hmm. And he happened to die about a year and a half ago as I was finishing up the book. So I'd never be had an opportunity, but fortunately he'd been interviewed already oh, that's good. in uh, All Our Ego magazine and that. So I had that to work from. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's kind of funny, Mark. I don't know, you know, you've interviewed a lot of creators in that in your time that, but sometimes when you cold call people, they're real hesitant to talk to you. Yes. <laughs> you know, yeah. especially especially like, you know, with these black artists who had such a bitter experience with comics and their families did and stuff and um well like for ezra jackson here's a good example mm -hmm. ezra jackson's daughter is congresswoman sheila jackson lee from houston who's mm -hmm. pretty well known okay i had an opportunity to talk with her a few months ago uh after the book came out and um she was just very appreciative of all this information because she said her father had such a bitter experience in comics and uh you know, he always regretted the way he was treated because he basically lost his job as soon as the white artist mm. came back. And she just appreciated that finally, you know, he was giving, you know, giving his due, his just due. And that's how it was for, you know, all these men. So it, it wasn't like it was, it was a pleasurable experience that I was recalling for a lot of these guys, you know, even their families probably didn't know hardly anything because you can understand all this stuff happened 70, 80 years ago. Right. So there's very few people around who even remember because most of these guys went on to other things right. and the comic books were a small part of their lives. Now, did the comics code have anything to do with the ending of their careers or was that long before? No, so that, that was, was like I say, most of them were out of comics. Yeah, were out of comics right after World War II. Okay. The second generation that came around, um, most of them left by the mid fifties and it wasn't the comics code but basically the comics implosion, the comic book industry implosion mm. that happened around 1955. You know, there was a lot of uh, companies left the industry even before the code was enacted. You know, there's a lot of these smaller companies that um, 
you know, went away. And so the writing was on the wall. And uh, you, I'm sure you found that, you know, for a lot of these guys, they said, okay, there's, I'm getting out of comics because this doesn't have a future here. Like, say, like guys like uh, Nostrum and stuff like that, you know, they, they went on other things, uh, you know, like uh, commercial advertising or whatever, you know, fine art. Some became teachers. And uh, like I said, each one of these black artists, it's really interesting because every single one of the ones that I, well, not every single one, but the vast majority of them went on to things like teaching or became fine artists and had some really, uh, really respectful careers. And, you know, one of them, uh, uh, Cal Massey worked at the, uh, Franklin Mint mm. and he was their head engraver for years mm. at the Franklin Mint. Most of the, uh, the Franklin Mint coins and uh, things that they put out were Calvin Massey designs, for instance, which people don't know, you know, <laughs> but he was a comic book artist. Yeah. <laughs> now, um, you mentioned Stan Lee, and of course, his timely Marvel and everything like that. What were, if anything, that you found in your research, the hiring practices of the other companies like DC or EC or anything else? Did they have well, any it's funny. restrictions or... Well, not it, it was just like the unwritten, you know, we just have our artists and we didn't think about, oh, they might be 99%. Well, well here's what's interesting. I have to back up a little bit here. Okay. In the early days of comics, most publishers didn't have their own staffs. They had most of their work they would purchase from comic shops, oh, that's true. which were yeah. studios. Yeah, you know, guys, that. Are, guys like Chester, or Eisner and Iger, or the Jacquette right. uh, shop, you know, they had these studios. So what a publisher would do is they would contact one of these studios, one of these shops and say like, hey, I need three comic books, three 64 page comic <laughs> books by, you know, two weeks from now. So the shop owner would get, you know, the job and then he would go out and hire as many artists as he needed. Again, we have a tendency to believe that these comic shops were static, uh, regular businesses. They weren't. Yeah. <laughs> they would hire what they need. Though they may have a few guys who are around all the time. But for the most part, they hired people when they needed them. Mm -hmm. So it was a real factory kind of uh, situation, an assembly line type situation. So it worked to the advantage of these Black artists because uh, these comic shop owners didn't care who they hired, okay? Mm -hmm. They just wanted the work done. If they're paying like two and $3 a page, get it done as fast as you can, mm -hmm. okay? Like for instance, Matt Baker worked in the Jerry Iger shop. Mm -hmm. He sat right next to Al Feldstein, who I interviewed for this book years ago. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like for instance, he would pencil in the stuff then hand it over to Feldstein who would ink it or mm -hmm. somebody else like Ray Osman or something like that you know, and these guys would ink it. So it was like an assembly line process that they were doing, trying to get this stuff done as quick as they could. Well, but most of these black artists, one of the nice things was working through a comic shop is that you didn't physically have to be in the studio. A lot of them would just get the assignment from the shop owner, say like a Jerry Iger. They would go home and draw it at home, come back and drop it off and give it to, you know, to the shop. And then the shop owner in turn would give it to the publisher. So any prejudices that the publisher may have didn't matter because they never knew who drew it. Right. They didn't have any idea. And I found again and again that there was a lot of uh, these black artists, they commented on that, that they never even saw the people they were, you know, the, the comic books they were drawing for because they never saw that. There was no interaction between the white publisher yeah. and the black artist. And it was like that way basically until almost the end of the 1940s. And then you would see companies like DC and, uh, you know, Timely and Fawcett and all stuff like that have their own staffs, mm -hmm. you know, and that's when the comic shops were dying out. But that's when like, you know, Stan Lee was hiring these guys and he hired almost all the black ones. Right. But when I interviewed Al Feldstein, he specifically told me, he, he told me, he goes, Ken, I'm ashamed to say, I never had a black artist work for me. He said, yeah. That's, and he was a real liberal, you know. Yeah, you know, yeah. And that's he why said, I was he kind says, of curious I'm embarrassed. He says, I'm embarrassed to tell you that. He yeah. says, but I honestly never had a black artist work. Only black person who worked for him was his secretary. Hmm. Uh, she was black. But other than that, he had no other black, you know, working for him. And he could have hired them. Yeah. You know, like I said, they were definitely out there. Yeah. But the only one who was hiring them was Stan Lee. <laughs> which is <laughs> interesting. I mean, that's really interesting, you know, to think about that. Yeah. You know? Because I'm on the EC fan page on uh, right. Facebook. I'm sure you are too, if you're not. I, I was, yeah. It. Yeah. Anyway, um, 
And, you know, people will postulate things like that. And it's usually Matt Baker. So like, why didn't Matt Baker work for EC? Right. And I go, I don't know, because he was still alive, but maybe he had a good gig elsewhere at the time well, at St. Well, John or whatever. Worked, I don't know. Yeah, well, he worked for St. John. Yeah. And he was, he basically had free run at St. John. He was basically the art director for the mm -hmm. company. Yeah. And, you know, he put out these spectacular romance comics, you know, the covers that are fantastic. And um, so I personally think Baker's one of about the five greatest pure artists to work in comics yeah. because he was very much in the illustrative vein, you know, and that's what he wanted to do. Comics were, were like a, a, a transitional thing in his mind. He wanted to be a commercial artist, to be a magazine artist. Mm -hmm. And Archer St. John hired him, you know, and he gave him free reign. And then Archer St. John started his own uh, magazine line. He put out a magazine called Nugget. Mm. And uh, Nugget was like a, a Playboy knockoff. Mm -hmm. Well, Matt Baker was the main artist on the first few issues of Nugget. Unfortunately, Archer St. John died of a drug overdose right after the first issue came out. <laughs> so his 19-year-old uh, son took over the company. He had no idea what was going on. And he basically let everybody else run the company. And um, St. John's wife fired almost the entire staff because Archer St. John was having an affair with uh, his uh, editor, Marion McDermott. Yeah. And so she went in and fired anybody who's connected to the comic books, including Matt Baker. Mm -hmm. You know, she just let him go. And so the last few years of Baker's life, he was just doing work for Stan Lee or Charlton or whatever he could pick up. He yeah. was doing Lassie comics for Dell. Right. You know, the <laughs> spectacular artist who could have, you know, gotten a job for any comic book company, yeah. couldn't find work. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Going back to EC. Yeah. They had some very enlightening stories, uh, you know, about race oh, yeah. and prejudice and things like that. And yeah, it is kind of interesting that they never hired a uh, black artist well, when you or, think about or it, I mean, letter or anything. You know, it's no, like, no. Uh, well, I mean, like, you know, uh, Jack Kamen was one of their artists. Well, Jack Kamen worked right next to, uh, to Matt Baker in, in the Iger shop. You know, they did a lot of work in the same comic books yeah. and Jack Kamen was hired, but Matt Baker wasn't. And Matt Baker was definitely better than Jack Kamen. Yeah. You yeah. know, I, I could just imagine the sort of stories he could have done, you know, if you uh, had an opportunity. Very interesting. But, <laughs> yeah. Now I will switch gears to Harvey because I always have to ask this. So um, in my research for the Harvey Comics Companion, mm -hmm. and I'm like you, you know, to do that book, it took me about 30 years of research, to be honest, exactly. you know, just going through everything, because there's like nothing out there uh -huh. uh, similar to your situation. So the only person I discovered, other than maybe like secretaries, like you're saying, that actually worked for Harvey, and I don't know if you have any information about him, uh, is a man named Bill Riley. And uh, well, see, that's a name I don't know. I yeah. mean, I'll have to uh, look okay. into that. And this is all what I know, and I do with? mention it in my book um, that he was born in 1918. I don't know when he passed away, but I think he might have still been alive when I did my book, but he might not be gone. <laughs> He'd be 103 now. So, um, and he was a writer on Little Lotta, and he also worked for DC. And that's all so I he know. He was a writer or an artist? He was a writer. So, okay. I mean, but I mean, that's the only person I know. For a fact that worked for Harvey at least back in the day because I mean later on Milton Knight worked for Harvey but you know in the 70s he did some Richie Rich stories and things like that but that's right. way later right you know, so, right um yeah uh, so in your okay. did, did you uh find anybody that worked for Archie or Harvey or anything like that the not, more not until comics? much later on I mean okay. I okay let, let me if you back way way up okay <laughs> uh in the beginning there was some who worked for uh, MLJ for instance you know, but it wasn't on the Archie, mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't later, you know, on the Archie comics and stuff like that. But for MLJ, for instance, there was um, Robert Pius. Mm -hmm. He did uh, some stuff from early, uh, uh, like Zip comics and stuff like that. He did some of the superhero and, you know, some of the comics like that. But most, again, you know, most of these artists were gone yeah. by, uh, after World War II. Right. And that, you know, so it, none of them made it. You know, it's, yeah. it, you know, during World War II, though, they worked for DC, some worked for Timely, some worked for, you know, pretty much everywhere. Fawcett, yeah. uh, Owen Middleton was an anchor with the Jack Bender shop, and he did a lot of work for Fawcett, yeah. you know, for instance. Well, based on uh, what you're saying earlier for um, 
in the case of Harvey, yeah, in the early days, they would have hired the same type of shops like the Iger shops exactly. and stuff like that. And uh, I have a list in my book of the people who work there, but I have no idea, except for the ones that we, I know, like Howard Post or something like that, or Marty Charles, right. whether they were white or black, you know, they were both right. white, but, you know, I didn't, I don't know about all the other ones. I just have a list in there because, you know, they don't say stuff like that, at least in mainstream publications. So. Well, what was interesting, you know, you know, in doing this book now, a lot of times, you know, when I would speak to a golden age artist, because again, there's still some around mm -hmm. uh, in the early uh, 2000s when I started on this. Mm -hmm. And almost invariably, they didn't know. I'd say like, by the way, did you ever know any black artists? And the only one who would come up would be Matt Baker and mm -hmm. Alvin Hollingsworth. Mm -hmm. Well, both of them worked in the shop. Matt Baker physically worked in the shop. And a lot of them knew Alvin Hollings were too. I don't know why, because he mentioned he didn't like going into the studio, but uh, that's the only two black artists whose names would come up. And time and again, I had these uh, white comic creators say like, I don't think they hired any blacks. I don't think there was any other blacks working in comics. Yet there were, they just didn't seem, again, that's why they were an invisible man. They were working through shops where they would go and get the assignment from the editor or, or whoever's running the shop. Then they would go home and drop or draw it, come back and drop it off. They a lot of times they didn't even know who they were working with, right. you know, who was inking it. Like they might pencil it and somebody else would ink it, and they'd never even meet each other. Yeah. Well, I mean, you when know, I started when I started doing comics history, and I'm sure you thought the same way, probably because of Stanley. Again, you know, you're the right. term bullpen, so it's like everybody's right. a big happy family. You're all in the building, right? Uh, drawing together, uh, throwing ideas back and forth. Yeah. It's really crazy time. And it's like, no, it's just a lonely existence at home and you mail it in or walk it in or whatever, you know? Yeah, you know? yeah. Well, I, I mean, a lot, a lot of these artists, like um, uh, I did a big thing on Bernard Bailey. Actually, I've written an entire book that's waiting to be published. But on Bernard Bailey, well, Bernard Bailey had his own shop, which you may know, but uh, he did a lot of stuff on his own. And I talked to his kids and they said, yeah, they can marry him coming home. And he would draw these covers and the specter and everything else at the kitchen table. He would sit down at the kitchen table and draw, and that's where he did all his work. You know, he wasn't working in a studio, a real fancy studio, you know, like you uh, picture an artist working stuff like that. No, he would sit at his kitchen table. They said he'd sit in his underwear at the kitchen <laughs> table, smoking cigarettes and working on these uh, comic books. <coughs> now, <clears throat> the other question I have is, um, did any of these artists that you encounter ever work in either prior to, during, or even after, like the animation industry? Because you know they had like Fleischer Cartoon Studio, which became Paramount. Yeah, I'm trying, trying to think later on was, and uh, there's Cherry Tunes, and um, you know because you hear about people like Floyd Norman who worked for Disney, but that's all right. in L.A. in Hollywood and right. stuff. So I mean, exactly. Were the there any who could possibly that, been, would have been for Fleischer? But yeah. I can't picture, I'm trying to think right offhand if there was one. Yeah. Later on, I believe there were some of the 1950s I know of who uh, mm -hmm. had a little bit to do with animation, but not early on, no. Okay. Again, you know, see, in the 1930s, Mark, um, okay, I don't know if you know about the Work uh, Progress uh, Administration. Yeah, yeah. During, okay, WPA, right. you know, the Roosevelt <laughs> New Deal yeah. thing. Right. And the whole idea was to employ all these unemployed artists. Mm -hmm. And they would paint murals and, you know, right. work on different art projects. Well, the main artists who worked for the WPA were minorities, mm -hmm. mostly black, but there was also like Jewish artists and stuff like that who couldn't get jobs working in regular white commercial art. Mm -hmm. Okay. The commercial art field in the 1920s and 30s was virtually all white. Mm -hmm. There was a, a handful you know, of others who made it in, like Mel Elmer Stoner and uh, Adolph Barreau were, you know, two of the ones who, who sort of like crossed the line, but the vast majority were just white Anglo-Saxon Protestant artists, and even Jewish artists couldn't get jobs. So what the WPA did was provided an opportunity for these artists. So almost all the Black artists, if they wanted to work, were doing stuff for the WPA, like uh, Stoner ended up working on the uh, 1939 World's Fair, for instance. And, you know, there's a lot of these artists, they did the same sort of thing. They would do stuff for the WPA. The problem was in 1940, uh, Congress defunded the WPA. 
Mm. So all these artists who've been working suddenly found themselves without jobs. And mm. that's why a lot of them drifted into the comic book industry, which basically was the only form of uh, commercial art that was hiring people at that time, you know, because it was, it was making uh, money hand over fist. But, and they weren't really particular about who they hired. Like I said, you know, they would hire anybody. They, they were hiring kids out of high school, some kids in high school, mm-hmm. you know, to draw form. And, uh, you know, again, it, it was in a weird way, it provided an opportunity to people who never would have had an opportunity. Mm-hmm. And that's why, you know, again, uh, the, the men I profile in my book, it's a very unique part of comics history because they weren't even allowed to work in comic strips, mm-hmm. basically. Because again, comic strips was a very elitist sort of uh, art form at that time. If you realize guys like Milton Kniff and Al Cap mm-hmm. and Hal Foster, these guys were celebrities at that time, very well paid, you know, millionaires and stuff. Right. These black artists didn't have a shot at doing that kind of stuff. They would do comic strips, but they do it in the black media. And that's where I, you know, I found a lot of their work was in the black media. Right. You know, you that's why it's, it's so interesting. You know, the, the, the two different worlds, that's what the whole book is basically about, about the two different worlds that blacks had to learn to uh, live in. The one world where they lived in the black community where, you know, the amongst their family and friends and where they did a lot of their work for the black media. And then the white world where they were basically invisible, but a lot of them, you know, would find work. Unfortunately, the sort of work they would find would be porters on trains and waiters and, mm-hmm. you know, stuff like that. It's, it's a total different dichotomy. And, you know, again, you know, I get into a lot of this stuff in the book. It, it, when you read it, one of the things before you even get going, if you would read the introduction I wrote, it's a five page introduction and the two page uh, forward by uh, Dr. Uh, Stanford Carpenter, who's a cultural anthropologist. Mm-hmm. Read those before you read anything else in the book because it'll give you a better understanding, not of where I came from in writing the book, but a lot of the background behind it. There, there's, there's a lot going on in the book other than just pictures of uh, you know comic book stories and stuff like right. that. Yeah. Um, you're mentioning comic strips. I mean, the one that I can think of that kind of uh, became kind of a celebrity in the same uh, sense is probably George Harriman. And but I think he right. was one of those ones that that passed for white, I believe. And people Except, well, know. see, I discussed that in my forum. Yeah. I just specifically yeah. discussed Harriman, yeah. and directly related to him is Adolph Rowe, because mm-hmm. Adolph Rowe also passed for white. Right. And uh, he's, you know he became very successful in commercial art and in early comic books. He literally worked on the first uh, uh, Malcolm Wheeler Nicholson, Nicholson uh, new fun comic. Mm. You know, so he's very, at the very beginning of comic books, mm. he worked on Sally the Sleuth, you know, all that stuff for Donnefeld's, uh, you know, uh, porn magazines and stuff mm. like that. He was very successful though, uh, comic book and commercial artist, but he passed for white. And he passed for the white to the point of where he made up a total different um, history for himself, mm. where he lied about where he came from. He lied about his family's name and everything. Mm. And even late in life, he became a, a, an arch conservative. He would write letters to his hometown paper in Charleston, South Carolina, talking about the, how he hated the liberals up in New York City. And he joined the Sons of the Confederacy. Wow. <laughs> yeah, and his son, his son, which I didn't, I don't really get into in the book because I didn't want any uh, lawsuits. Yeah. But his son is is a big um, shot in the Republican Party. He was an advisor to Richard Nixon, mm. and he's still. But he's they've never acknowledged that they're black. You know that they're mm. part black because they passed for white. <laughs> it's a really interesting history there. Like I said, some of the stuff I couldn't really get into. Maybe I'll be sued now. I'm telling you this, but you know, mm. it's it's something that they deny, even yeah. though. It can be proven, you know. Now, the other industry I wanted to ask about, uh, besides the animation industry and the comic strip industry, uh, is uh, advertising because Madison Avenue, Mm -hmm. big time. Did anybody cross over that way, or was it still the same kind of prejudices? It was the the same thing. It it was the same thing. And the ones who did make it, they did it much later on in the 1950s. Right. You know, in the 1940s, though, the only ones who were able to do it was Barrow because he could pass for white and mm-hmm. Elmer Stoner. 
who uh, was unique. Elmer Stoner was actually, he was a very light skinned black. He could have passed for white if he wanted, but he didn't. Mm -hmm. But he was um, an artist of the Harlem Renaissance. He, he was a fine artist during the Harlem Renaissance, painter and everything, very well respected. He was able to cross over in, into the commercial art world and do a lot of advertising and stuff like that. But he's about the only one. All these other black artists who were equally as talented and stuff didn't even have a shot. They didn't have a chance to do it. Like I said, even Matt Baker, that was Matt Baker's dream. Right. And he wasn't able, as talented as he was, he wasn't able to do it. Interesting. Um, so on the book again, I'll hold it up one more time since I'm doing this. And also I'll show you, if you don't know Matt Baker's work, <laughs> there, that's Matt Baker's work. <laughs> um, right. Uh, you said you started working on this about 20 years ago. At the time, I'm sure there was probably an intention, at least a series of articles, if not a book. Uh, did you approach different publishers? I noticed you're on Yo Books imprint at IDW. Did Craig Yo personally contact you? How did that come about to get the book published? Okay. Like I said, I've been doing this for a long time, and I know a lot of people in uh, uh, publishing and stuff like that. Right. Um, Craig, his, I've done stuff for him before, articles and things like that, and uh, right. some very long articles that appeared in some of his books. And about five years back, he said, what do you want to do a book on? <laughs> I said, seriously? He goes, yeah. And I, you know, I listed a couple of different projects. And this one here, he just lit up. He goes, yes. He says, do it. Go ahead and do it. I, I said, this is something I've been working on for like 20 years. See, I have insatiable curiosity, uh, Mark. <laughs> I want to know everything. So I study a lot of stuff at, at one time. Right. And um, there's a lot of different areas I can write about. But this, this, the, my interest in, in these Black artists was particularly, uh, I was passionate about because it was something that I know nobody else had really even covered before. Yeah. And it was one of those sort of things like, I got to let people know this stuff. Yeah. You know, because it's 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 a it's a blind spot that we have, mm -hmm. you know, not just in, in comics history, but in American history, mm -hmm. you know, in, in excluding blacks from our history. And, it, you know, and not everything in black history was, you know, slavery or reconstruction. You know, blacks are integral to a lot of aspects of American history. And that's what I, you know, I try to get across again with this book. You know, they were participating in everything. And again, you know, that's why this book seemed to touch a lot of different people, you know, outside the comic book industry, which meant an awful lot to me because that, that was kind of the, the whole purpose of it. My whole goal with doing all of my comics history research is, is to make comics history a part of American history, to make it part of uh, art history. Like I said, I, I have an art history background and it would frustrate me and we'd be talking about 20th century art and there's no mention of comic books right <laughs> okay this is back in the 1980s when i was in college and i'm going like how, i mean i ended up getting in arguments with professors about that stuff <laughs> that's not art, you know <laughs> and i say how can you not talk about this stuff and i go well that's not really artwork you, you know? know and it is i mean you know i don't have to convince you but you know it, but over time now people become more accepting of that yeah. and you know, it, it, it's it's really heartening to me after doing this for so many years to finally make that break, you know, to, to be able to say like, here is history. You know, this comic books were a part of American history here. And like I say, I, I had this opportunity to uh, speak with uh, uh, the head librarian at the Library of Congress. She bought my book. It's Dr. Carla Hayden, and she's a fan of my book. So we had this conversation between me her and uh, Congresswoman Jackson Lee, where we all talked about my book and, and uh, Dr. Hayden say how important my book is because it reveals a part of black history mm -hmm. that she'd never known about. And she's, you know, this isn't a person who's a comic book fan. You know, this is a person as approaching as is a very literate, uh, uh, you know, uh, historian and, you know, uh, literary person. And I said, and that, that means a lot to me that, you know, now my book is being used uh, in college classes. I've spoken to uh, several colleges now uh, where they're using it as a, a teaching tool in schools and stuff like that. And that really excites me because that opens up for all of us 
you know, all, you know, you know, for your studies and everything else, because right. people see like, there's valid history here. It's a comics are comics history is a rich, fertile field of history. that's never been taken seriously, except for a handful of us who have been beating our heads against the wall for all this time, you know, trying to get people to say like, look, look at this stuff. This is really interesting. Yeah. And I'm similar to you as a comics historian, you know, it's like, oh, yeah. I mean, I could write the, the, the sta same standard mainstream stuff, but it bores me. I would rather mm -hmm. have the people who are experts at Marvel and DC and superheroes do their thing. I can read about it right. and I can go into delve into my areas, Harvey and Archie or whatever, and go really nitty gritty deep, present that. And then people can go, oh, there was more to comic books than just the big two. It's just like yours. Oh, there's more to comic books than just the exactly. sample of white artists. It was a whole variety of people, but we just never knew about them. Right. It's, it's, you know, you hit the nail on the head there, Mark, because that's what I tell people. I say the comic book industry was built and mostly uh, created by thousands of people who you don't even know about. OK, mm -hmm. it wasn't just, you know, Jack Kirby and Will Eisner and Stan Lee. Mm -hmm. You know, there's thousands of people and many of them are very, very talented. I said, you've just never been exposed to it, you know, right. and unfortunately and fortunately, comic book fans have been the ones who've been the care keep, care, uh, care keepers of comics history over time. You know, we're the ones who, who, who've told the stories and written them down and stuff. But the problem with being fans is, is that it gets in your way of being a historian. Yeah. I try to approach my histories as a journalist because that's yeah. part of my background. You know, and just present the stories mm -hmm. and, you know, try to leave the fanish part in the background. Yeah, yeah, I'm a comic fan. I mean, I just bought two more comics today. Yeah. I don't you put know, the ooh stuff the in my book either. I let the people read it, do the ooh and ah, and I just say, here's the facts. This is what exactly. I Exactly. And, you know, and that's the way you got to do it, Mark. If we're going to have a lasting history that people are going to read, mm -hmm. that's how we have to present it. Because there's only so many books you can write about Jack Kirby, okay? Right. You know, I love Jack Kirby. Great, yeah. you know, great art, stuff like that. But what about Matt Baker? You know, what about Jay Jackson? What about Alvin Hollingsworth or these other guys? So many talented people out there, you know, who worked in comics. And, you know, there's even side stories about the publishers. I like writing about the publishers because a lot of them are really interesting people. Like I said, you know, th th this is... Uh, I look at it as this is my um, my legacy in, in the sense of like, you know, I'm leaving behind. OK, I'll sh I'm going to give you everything I got. Work from there. You know, take it. This isn't the last word. on. Please don't you know let it be the last word. But pick up, you know, the, the cudgel and, and take it, you know, run with it. Yeah. I was telling people about that, about Harvey. It's like I gave you my book. Now it's your turn to write your book, you know, exactly. And and exactly. they can use my book as a basis, but expand upon it, build upon it, you know, right, find right, new right. directions with it, you know, new observations. I was talking, I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday. He's a college professor who's also a comic fan. And, I, you know, what I told him, one of the things that's always frustrated me is how people hoard information. Okay. I'm sure you've run into that where people will know something that you don't know, but they right. won't tell you what it is. Right. Or they won't allow you to use it. Right. And they go like, oh, what's the point of that? I mean, how can you hoard information? That's how you, you learn things. Like exactly. I'm very open. That's why I put so much stuff on Facebook. You know, a lot of stuff I discovered, I just yeah. put it out there for everybody. Here it right. is, you know, and some mm -hmm. people build off of that. I mean, that's why I'm used as a reference so often mm -hmm. because a lot of people say like, Hey, can I use this? I go, sure. Or I'll end up writing a chapter or two for me, you know, just to help expand upon their thing. I, you know, I don't have that big an ego to think that I own the history I study. Okay. Right. Right. You know, same with me. I'm, yeah. I'm just, like I say, I'm a journalist. I'm covering the story. This is what it is. You know, mm -hmm. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you're interested, but it's not, you know, I'm just telling the story. That's all yeah. it is, you know. And with your in-depth coverage of things, that's why I thought you had written a book, say, on Will <laughs> Eisner, you know, because, you know, you well, used to the, have that. As your avatar and things like that. Well, oh, I still do. I, I, I have I have a huge Will Eisner collection that yeah. <laughs> literally is probably one of the top five in the world. Okay, I constantly keep buying stuff, which yeah. frustrates my wife to no end. But you know, <laughs> related to Will Eisner, and um, eventually that that's probably going to be my 
uh, my my uh, masterpiece or whatever is to do a a, a huge Eisner yeah. thing, especially on the obscure Eisner stuff, because that's what I kind of specialize in the things that he did in the 1930s or the things he did while he was in the military. Because right. I want that to be my magnum opus, you know, where all this stuff you know I bring out that uh, he did. And, that's basically what I've collected. And I want to share with people on that before I donate all this stuff, because I'm going to, I'm working right now to figure out who I'm going to give all this stuff to, yeah. because I have such a unique collection mm-hmm. of material. I've been doing this for 60 years. You know, I was <laughs> lucky to obtain a lot of this stuff early on when it was still humanly possible. Right. And it, it, was, it, it wasn't, you know, you didn't have to own Amazon to buy a comic book, you know, you know, it, it's normal people were collecting comics. At the right. Time. Yeah, you can collect back issues for, you know, a few dollars, but, you know, not millions like that. Oh, I know. So, it's, it's, Mark, yeah. it's so silly right now. <laughs> the way you price. I look at eBay, you know, and I go like, you got to be kidding. And yeah. like, I'm, I'm not a fan of, of slab comic books and that. Yeah. I mean, it makes my skin crawl yeah. because not only doesn't make any sense to me, you know, mm-hmm. taking a, a, a book, basically and put it in the frame. You know, what about everything that's inside the book? But anyway, right. you know, but the, I, the whole idea is, is that you're encapsulating history. Right. I mean, think about if they found uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls and you put it in somewhere where nobody could read it. Mm-hmm. You know, what's the point of that? You know, you, you got to have it so people in the future can study it and appreciate it and stuff. Right. And again, I'm lucky that I've had a lot of this material or I know people who have a lot of this material and have been very... Uh, willing to share it with me, you know, over uh, years and years, because right. a lot of stuff isn't, a lot of the things I study are in comic books that I would never be able to uh, buy if I went out and tried to buy them now, you know, mm-hmm. and so I, you know, I said, I try to share as much as what I have, you know, with everybody out there. Mm-hmm. Now, we, I mentioned Eisner, so uh, this book actually won, um, or was nominated, or did it win? Oh, it won. Yeah, won. Yeah, yeah, I won. Yeah, I thought I won. it won. Yeah, I won. Best comics related book. Uh, yeah, and uh, I, I voted me. for it, so I, I was one of the champions. Yeah. And that was even before I see. I wanted this book a long time, you know. It's like, and it just it just took me a while to get it, you know. Just I yeah. only got it about a week or two ago, and then that's when I contacted you. I said, Ooh, "This is well, good. I'm glad." Yeah. I'm really glad <laughs> but I won. I mean, it's before you know, it came out. Not, not just because you know, for the sales, which are nice, but. Mm-hmm. I want as many people to uh, have an opportunity. One of the things I'm trying to get uh, IDW to do is uh, put out a paperback version. Mm-hmm. It's more affordable. Yeah. So they can, you know, like uh, maybe a lot of kids or something who would never be exposed. Because it, it's important to me to get this sort of information into the hands of young artists, man, too. Because that's right. one thing. I've had several Black artists tell me, they say, I wish I knew known yeah. that there was other Black artists, you know, growing up. Yeah. which is interesting you know when you hear that because artists who are like my age like in the 60s they didn't grow up knowing other black artists there were no there were no examples it was one of those sort of things like oh blacks don't go into comic books right. you know and it's weird to think of that but that was yeah. uh you know the thinking at that time yeah so it, it's it's important to show examples of what people can do you know, I mean, it's that, not even it's in the uh, comic book industry. It's in all industries. Like, uh, you exactly. know, you, you probably saw the film Hidden Figures. Oh, and, yeah, exactly. You know, there was a book and then they did make a children's version of the book. And I actually bought that one, too, because it was simplified. So a child yeah. of eight, nine years old could read it instead of the big technical uh, jargon right. that's in the adult book, as it were. But, you know, and then right. the film's great. If you haven't seen it, Hidden Figures. Oh, yeah, I saw it. Excellent. You know? <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. uh, you know, and then the other movie is, uh, and then I interviewed uh, uh, Jim Nybar, who uh, did a book on it, is, you know, Green Book about, you know, right. where, you know, everybody right. had yeah. to have a special guide for traveling around uh, the country to go to specific hotels or specific restaurants or whatever, you know, and it's all like and this it, stuff that I didn't know about until about 10 years ago, well, see, you know, it, or that's less. That's what's weird about it, Mark. You know, it's... Yeah. Writing this book was, was like I've told people, it was transformational for me. And again, if you read the introduction, I, I talk about it a bit in there because I always thought I knew a lot about American history and stuff. <laughs> and as I started reading all these black newspapers and that, I was basically embarrassed about how much I didn't know, mm-hmm. you know, and it was really eye-opening. 
yeah. you know, for, for me to be exposed to that stuff. Like, you know, the first mentions I ever saw of the, of the Tulsa massacre were about 20 years ago in these black newspapers. Yeah. When did you ever hear about that, you know, in the past, until the past couple of years? You see what I'm saying? It's right. that stuff has been excised from American history. Right. And, you know, it's, it's really important that Americans know their full history, not just right. uh, George Washington chopping down a cherry tree, you know, there's, yeah. there's, there's a lot. Which is semi-fictional, you know. <laughs> exactly. But you see what I'm saying, you know, it's, yeah, yeah. there's so much more, you know, good and bad. That's, yeah. that's all part of the picture, yeah. you know, and we have to understand that. And, and what's weird about it is you think, you know, like I said, I'm 68 years old, born 1952. Mm -hmm. A lot of the stuff, I just think about what's occurred during my lifetime. Right. You know, and think, the things that I was so oblivious to and, and didn't know about. And, and it's really uh, a personal, uh, like I said, it was transformational for me in working on this book and learning all this stuff. Like I said, I was embarrassed. I, I truly was, you know, in, in writing this book because how much I didn't know when I started it. But don't you get a feeling of satisfaction, at least I do, when you utter oh, yeah. some sort of nugget or resource or something that you had never seen? It makes you feel good. I'm oh. the one finding this, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, it, it is. You know, it's yeah. that, that, that's kind of the, the personal uh, satisfaction you get. I, you know, it's, it's sort of like, the, the, the real gold nuggets that you find after you've been looking through an entire field, you go like, oh, yeah, now I got this, you know, right. <laughs> you know, I, I've been able to stumble on, you know, a few things like that in comics history where I've been able to, you know, find stuff that had been out there that nobody had seen before. And that, that's a personal reward. But, uh, you know, the bigger reward is, is just being able to, to share this with everybody. And that's what I really get a kick out of. Mm -hmm. You know, I love when people say like, oh, I never knew that before. That right. to me, that that is the greatest satisfaction. Yet I never knew that before, yeah. because now that you know it, it, it's it's you added it to your knowledge, and maybe you'll pass it on, and maybe you know you'll build upon it or something. Yeah. I always say this about books like this: is that I'm glad you wrote it, so I wouldn't have to. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> all I can do is just uh, kick back and enjoy it. I didn't have to do the 20 years of research. Yeah, well, and I'm very like glad said, you you've did. done your own research, yeah. so you, you yeah. can appreciate it. You know, yeah. again, you can appreciate from a different angle. You know, from a, yeah. a, a historian angle, that. Yeah. And that that that's what's really cool about this. Like I say, that's what I think was neat about the book. Mm -hmm. But I, to be honest, I was I was shocked to win the Eisner Award because. Yeah. Who am I? You know, nobody knows me. Right. Have you actually gotten the award yet, or did they just? Tell uh, you well, yet? they're engraving it right now. Okay, they, yeah, because I know it's pretty day. recent, so that's why I was like, "Did you win it?" I, you know, I thought you had because I mean, yeah. obviously, because of the pandemic, they're not having official, yeah, uh, San yeah. Diego Comic Convention right now, and next year they yeah. probably. Of will. course not. I didn't get to go to San Diego. Yeah. And I got to sit home. <laughs> Maybe they'll do a retroactive one next year. I they'll have know. three I years of really awards. <laughs> I don't know, but anyway. <laughs> Um, yeah. But anyway, that's uh, entirely cool that you have won for that. It is very well deserving. I mean, the oh, other nominees you. were good too, but yours oh, yeah. just stood out. I said, I got to nominate this. I haven't even read it, but I know the subject matter is good. I know you're a good writer. So I knew, well, thank you, you know, and then, you know, I haven't been disappointed uh, since I got the book. So I'm very happy. So, well, like I said, I, I hope you, you know, when you read it, you drop me a line, just let me know what you think of it as a whole and stuff okay and make sure you read it like i said the intro and uh, the yeah. forward because <laughs> it, it 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 lends a lot to the understanding of the book i think especially uh stanford carpenter's uh forward he's he's very insightful and he's very succinct in the way he sums up the uh the themes of the book in that and i, I really like the way he approached it very good okay um i don't really have any other questions so this okay. is the time at the end of the show i usually say uh Tell us uh, what you're working on. Plug your book. Obviously, you have the okay. book, and well, uh, well, I'll hold it up again. And how people can get in contact with you if they have any information or questions or okay. anything else. Well, if somebody wants to get in contact with me, they can either do it through Facebook, which is <laughs> under my name, you know, Ken Quattro, Q U A T T R O, mm -hmm. uh, or um, I have a blog called uh, The Comics Detective Blog. Um, there's another way, or you can use my email, which is kquatro, K-Q-U-A-T-T-R-O at comcast.net. 
Um, currently, like I said, I'm working on the sequel to the book, but I'm also working on another book, which I can't tell you about, which is <laughs> kind of related, but it's not, but it's coming from the same publisher. And I also have another long article that I'm working on of uh, an artist named Andre LeBlanc. He used to work for Will Eisner, uh, but he was also a highly respected artist in Brazil at the same time and a fascinating artist and a fascinating uh, career. And I have several other things. At, at any given time, I have a half a dozen different uh, writing projects I have going. So I keep busy. <laughs> All right. Well, I thank you, Ken, for being a guest today on Bread Ideas Podcast. It was a pleasure. And, well, it was uh, a pleasure for me too, Mark. I really enjoyed talking with you about this. Me too. Thank you very much. Have a great day. You too. Take care.